everything works, great. So um, I was asked to give uh, just a general introduction to free software. I think uh, previous speakers done a, a very good job of uh, covering the, the basics. So I want to sort of pick out some of the, the, little, um, the little facts and fictions around that, that uh, colour in all of, the, all of the mystery to open source and free software. And I suppose in particular, I've been um, tasked with getting across that for a lot of us here, we are technologists and we are familiar with these concepts. But there's also, I guess, uh, for at least some people here, a little bit of ambiguity about what free software, what open source is. And in particular, that when we're talking about free software, we're talking about free software in the conference, one of the great things is it's not just about software. We're going to see example data, uh, how that can be opened, uh, how government processes can be opened, looking at methodologies, even creative works, artworks, music. And we're going to hear about how processes and designs can be opened and how that can collaboration can give access much more widely to those who need it. So last year I did a, an historical introduction um, and to give a, a context. And I'm not going to uh, recap the whole thing because I think those of you who were there last year have suffered enough. But I'm going to give a potted introduction because I think it is quite important. There's an aspect of free software, and we talk about free, that it's more than just about cost. It is about, um, about access and about sharing. And that's something much older than uh, computers or than software. So we look at uh, history of intellectual property, conflicts in intellectual property. Where did it all begin? Where did it all start? Where did this become an issue internationally? And the answer is actually Sligo, um, 1,500 years ago. And at the time, uh, St. Columba, the, one of the patron saints of Ireland and Scotland, he, uh, he went down to the great centre of learning, travelled across miles and miles to get to Bangor, and he went to Movilla Abbey. And in Movilla Abbey was St Finian. St Finian was a, a renowned scholar, and he had a beautiful psalter, which may have actually been one of the first of its kind in Ireland. And he, uh, Columba, diligently copied the whole thing out, word for word, that was all grand. Then he left and St. Finian said, wait a second, did you, did you just copy my Psalter? Now we're not entirely clear whether Columba had managed to mention this, but St. Finian got quite irate and said, well, that, I own the book, I own the copy. And this, you know, as these things do, one of them passes it to the boss, the next one passes the boss, it escalates up. And the next thing you know, the High King of Ireland is issuing a declaratory judgment. It says, to every cow belongs her calf, to every book its copy. Not great for Columba, who has just been told that he has to give up this thing. Uh, you can imagine, you've seen those illustrated manuscripts. Just think about trying to write one of those from scratch. Someone says, actually, I'll just have that back now. So that turned into a major battle with 3,000 casualties. And with a couple of other elements thrown in, St. Columba was exiled to Iona, which became a centre of medieval learning. Now, I'm not suggesting that in terms of IP, you should go to the, the extent of having a battle of 3,000 casualties. I'm not recommending this. But it's worth bearing in mind that there is a, f a fantastic history that's um, right at our doorstep. Much later, we see uh, printing. And printing, of course, well, that suddenly is about making lots of copies of things relatively fast. And actually, printing goes back to 868. Now, I was walking through the British Library one day. Um, I don't know where I was going, but I happened to end up in the British Library. It was a lovely experience. I'd highly recommend there's a standing exhibition and you can go in and have a look around, and they have jewels of international artwork, of uh, literary artwork. And they have ancient religious texts, and they have some writings by John Lennon on the back of a notepad, everything. And one example is the very oldest dated printed work from 868 in China. And it says on it, reverently made for universal free distribution. And that's the oldest printed work we have with an actual date. Which is another interesting point. Is the first uh, one of the common themes with copyright is that we do put dates on things. Well, the first time we did it, it was to get rid of it. Now that's not to say there's not a very key point. And we move forward to the printing press, and copyright is extremely important to make sure that this uh, industry of writing survives the printing press and all of the uh, immediate fast reproduction. Um, in particular, in 1841, 
we start to get the printing presses now around and people are starting to print. Um, there's a fantastical quote somewhere about a nation of piratical booksellers <laughs> who, are, um, who are copying all of these books and selling them. And it gets right to Parliament. This is the first time we're really, really talking about copyright extension. 20 years, 1841. And Thomas Macaulay, Baron Thomas Macaulay, also a writer in his own note, comes out with this wonderful phrase. I believe, sir, that I may with safety take it for granted that the effect of monopoly is to generally make articles scarce, to make them dear and to make them bad. And I may with equal safety challenge my honourable friend to find out any distinction between copyright and other privileges of the same kind. Any reason why a monopoly of books should produce an effect directly the reverse of that which was produced by the East India Company's monopoly of tea or Lord Ex Essex's monopoly of sweet wines. Now, <clears throat> for those of you who have seen Pirates of the Caribbean 1 to 3, you'll know being compared to the East India Company is not generally favourable. Um, moreover, Macaulay wasn't arguing against copyright. He said in that very same speech, that's very, it is, there are uh, important protections, but also that um, there's a distinction between a monopoly and the benefits of sharing, and that's part of what the law is protecting as well. So, <coughs> moving forward, uh, that was quite a seminal, important piece of, um, of rhetoric in the copyright debate in terms of forming law. But no computer programs for some time. When computers finally come along, um, and this is uh, very interesting to hear the, uh, the detail on the Queen's Library uh, there. That was, that's fantastic. I'm going to have to look more into that now. But that, at the t um, prior to platform independence, a lot of software was being written specifically for a, for a computer, and it was part of the tools. If you are spending a fortune on a computer, you're getting the tools, you need to know how to use it. And you need to be able to go through it. It's specialists who are using it. So this idea of what, what, if you close that, it becomes harder to use for the person who's just bought it isn't, a nece isn't necessary. Once you start seeing software as a commodity later on, then it is necessary that, uh, for that to be a commodity, to have some sort of protection that it's, uh, that it's commercializable. And that's where we start to see this division come in. Now, um, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be a, a proper Belfast uh, Linux user group speaker up at the front here uh, talking about uh, free software if I didn't have a title with the uh, slide with the Bastille on it, but um, just to just to fulfill my stereotype. But there is actually an interesting aspect that comes in here where people start to see this uh, tension and start to say, okay, well, is there, where does the philosophical principle in this lie? So, <coughs> and philosophy here, that's about security, it's about accountability, uh, reliability, that can be benefited, it can be, you can have... Uh, it's a debate. It's, there's two sides to this. Um, that can be about uh, control and freedom um, of your equipment. It can be about um, bringing together and building something in common. It brings together lots of different strands. But then, where did this, where did this kind of philosophical debate come from? And the figure of Richard Stallman, quite a prominent figure that we would uh, hear quite a bit of, fantastic... Um, fantastic personality, uh, but quite a, quite a challenge as well. He, uh, one day, as, as a lot of these things do, he was working in a printing in a lab in MIT, and he came along, he came across a printer that wasn't working. He said, how do I solve, how do I solve this? I, you know, I'll go and fix the source code. And he was told, no, you can't, it's proprietary. And he did what every good uh, you know, postgraduate student would do in the situation. He, he wrote a manifesto, and he said, um, there's four freedoms I should have with software to run it whatever way I want, to redistribute it to whoever I want, study the code to understand how it works, and to share those improvements with others. Okay, so that's all very philosophical, but how did that actually affect the world? Why are we all sitting here? It's more than philosophy. And it's actually because it turns out to be extremely economical as well. There's a real, if you have five people who are producing the same, effectively the same software, and they can share what they're doing, it's more productive. Those individuals are more productive economically, and it's more efficient. Um, so you start to see businesses <coughs> looking at more friendly ways. Now, Richard Stallman was quite ardent. If you use my software that's free, your software is free, in business, um, th there was much more of an idea that, okay, we all, maybe we want to produce something that's proprietary. doesn't mean we can't share parts of what we're doing. 
<coughs> so where is open technology? I guess that kind of brings us up to, up to roughly where we are, that uh, open technology is now something that brings us into a room in uh, Belfast and we're talking about data, we're talking about software, we're talking about things that are ardently free, we're talking about things that are uh, useful and usefully free and incorporating them in lots of different packages. And we'll see some fantastic examples of that throughout the day. But I just want to pick out some key examples. So where is open technology? Well, there's the map of the globe. So I'm just going to be really awkward and post one that's not, post someone that's not on it. Space. ISS is a relatively um, uh, key convert to the, kind of the Linux um, approach. And they said, we're actually going to move the thing to Linux because we need that. We need that insight, that transparency. We need that security. Um, and that's now running Linux on the space station itself. However, that's not just space, it's not just uh, the infrastructure, it's also the analysis. And parts of the analysis are done with, with excellent proprietary software, there's no question. Parts of it are also done with excellent open source software. That even the tools that you're using, the research you're carrying out, uh, using things like Python. Python, another piece of free software. So this is something that isn't constrained to a particular setting, to a particular region. It's expand, expanding to wherever it's needed. I'll go the other direction. Um, because I have a very vague understanding of how maps work. Um, so down in the Antarctic, you see a lot of research there, a lot of analysis. Again, how do you do analysis? Well, you use tools that you can collaborate on. And often, this is a little bit of a theme, my background is in science, is that you see researchers using this as a way of collaborating and exchanging information in a standardised, reproducible way. Um, also, I picked the Antarctic because I quite like that picture, but it's just as valid as anywhere else. Um, <coughs> I've worked with Antarctic scientists who are using open source. And in case anyone didn't see that coming, the summary is really, it's everywhere. We're using smartphones, they have open source, they have free software. We are using smart TVs, we are using computers, we are doing research. 98% of the world's supercomputers are running Linux. Um, for most of us in industrial applications, I think we'll agree that uh, whatever we're doing, whether it's web or whether it's uh, even in the office context, there are pieces of open source that make our lives easier. So given all that, why are, I think this is, this is a brilliant turnout, but and great to see everybody here. But if I'm standing here saying, this affects everybody, and if you're a software developer, you're gonna come into contact with this stuff, where does this actually leave you? Why, why, where, is, where is that information? Where is, where is everybody kind of trying to find this information? It's understanding. Well, there are some challenges, and I think part of what we're here to do is see how open source can benefit us, uh, benefit uh, others, and how we can actually use it in a productive com uh, way to communicate. One of those aspects is awareness, <coughs> and in particular, that's about being able to say, for example, there are companies who are able to provide quite a, uh, a clean-cut example of this is how you use our software and this is where you can use our software. Sometimes if you are a developer, developers are often scratching their own itch. C fantastic book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. If you're involved in uh, open source projects, it's a great analysis of, of how they come together and how they're sustainable. And one of those things is developers scratch their own itch. They solve their problem, then they share it with others because they've benefited already, actually. But that doesn't have a marketing budget. So there is about... Um, how do you share that information? How do you get people involved? And that improves, because it's a communal production, that improves, uh, improves the software or the data for us. And that's events like this. That's meetups, <coughs> like the Belfast Linux User Group, if anyone wants to come along. Um, it's also things like, I've got uh, this. Um, this is not a MacBook. <laughs> yeah, that's, there's, there's a few people there who are, yeah, they, uh, I've seen that one before. You've just stuck something over the, over the little apple. No, it's actually... This is a laptop by a company called Purism. It was kickstarted by a whole load of people who decided that they really liked MacBooks but wanted to have a custom Linux machine. Um, they're also slightly, slightly paranoid, so I've got uh, buttons on either side that cut the, cut the power to my camera and to my microphone. So even if someone hacks into my computer, changes things, installs software that will secretly film me when I switch my camera off, huh, I've, cut the I've cut the power. Um, 
So it came with a free tinfoil hat, but it didn't arrive in the post at the same time, and I think there's a reason. <laughs> but what is marketing? What is onboarding? What is awareness? That's part of it. You now all know there's a company called Leapfrom, uh, called Purism, who make these laptops. And they've done a great job of raising that information on Kickstarter and um, by convincing me to shell out for one. Um, so also legalities. And this is actually, <coughs> in fairness, there is quite a valid point here in terms of legalities that open source does have legal implications. Certain types. Some licenses you can use freely. Uh, we've seen a selection of the licenses in the previous slide, our previous presentation, and particularly some of them are incompatible with others. Some of them are com incompatible with proprietary licenses. And so if you are using a piece of free software, you need to be aware of that. Um, that's even things like Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow uh, <coughs> had a bit of an issue last year where someone went, people are using bits of code from, from these answers, and these answers are technically Creative Commons share alike. And for those of you who are aware of that license, that means that what you put it into, you should be sharing. Um, and technically, that covers it. So we'll just fix that up. Then a few people turned around and said, maybe we don't want that fixed up. <laughs> maybe we like that principle. And suddenly, you get into a kind of awkward discussion about well, what, what's the implication for more than non-trivial uh, amounts of code that have been used from Stack Overflow. Now, there's another aspect that's completely, this isn't just open source to emphasize. Um, there have been issues where people have posted something they found somewhere else in a Stack Overflow answer that turns out to have a proprietary license. Doesn't actually mean that copying it from Stack Overflow gets around that. Um, one particular example I, I, I quite like is uh, a company called Company X who produced a bit of GPL software. <clears throat> and just in case people are wondering, is this is something that's a theoretical concept or is this actually comes to court? And uh, company A decides to use that bit of software in their product, but they decide GPL is quite, quite specific. If you are building something on this, you need to share the code with your, with your customers. And they didn't. They handed it off to company B, company A charged company B for all of these expensive licenses and they passed a few, company B passed a few around the back to their clients. Company A said, well, you've just sold, you've just sold our software and we're going to sue you. Company B turned around and said, well, you put GPL in that. So company X, back over here, leaned over and said, ah, great, I'll sue you both. And <laughs> so that's not necessarily the most productive way. Generally speaking, you are relatively safe because people are keener to get uh, things working together, to get compliance and to work cooperatively. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind. So how do you get around that? Well, understanding what the licenses are, and we'll have a, a panel discussion later, um, and we'll try and touch on some of those issues, but please do ask questions. Okay. The other one I just like, I kind of like this because it's a catchy title, is um, Granada Gambit. And it's the hope that if I've got this bit of software, right, I've just written this app, I've just put it on the App Store. And once one billion people download it, I will actually be able to sit on a beach in the middle of the Caribbean and I'll never have to work again. The money just keeps rolling in. And you know something that's very hard if you're doing an open source project. Open source, there are, there are business streams, but they are things that involve uh, continual work. So there is a question, of course, if you're thinking, maybe I could make that fortune, that means I don't have to work again. Or you can see how that's a scale as well is what's the reality? Is it better to have that cooperation? And for some applications it is, for some it isn't. So open source and free software are not necessarily controversial, not necessarily things that always have to be uh, the solution you take. So how do you solve a couple of these? Um, strategy and sustainability, that's one aspect. It's finding a model that brings money in. I need to eat. Uh, I am um, running a company that's I'm self-employed. Those two things have to tie together if I want to do open source. There are ways of doing that, whether it's looking at freemium services for some people, uh, producing free software with additional extras, or maybe it's looking at providing bespoke services. I'm cheaper to bring in than spending an, en uh, an engineer at 30, 40,000 spending uh, their <coughs> significant amount of their time to learn something I'm already an expert in. Um, coordination and onboarding, again, that's from the other end. If you want to have a successful open source project or a community, either as a business or as an individual, 
then you need to be able to collaborate. Tools like GitHub, I'm just going to step outside of the conference for a second. If you're not aware of Git and GitHub and you're a student here, I would strongly recommend from a general software development perspective, get familiar with it because it's very relevant in industry. Back into the conference. Um, that's also very relevant for open source and sharing. And there's a group of our business who are looking at ways of collaborating on open source projects to try and, to try and grow that industry even here in Belfast. So if you are interested in those small businesses, have a chat to me. And finally, building in feeding back. Um, so how do we actually contribute back to uh, these projects? It's not necessarily by code, but it is important. And it Heartbleed's a great example. Uh, for those of you who are aware of it, when it turned out that one of the key bits of open source infrastructure underlying the internet was a lot less secure than expected. And multi-billion dollar companies were depending on a piece of software that virtually none of their money was going to the people who were writing it and maintaining it. It was going to security researchers examining it, but not to the people writing it. So that had to get, that had to get fixed because they realized there's no point in us uh, having all this infrastructure and not even giving something to the project that maintains it. That doesn't have to be money, it can be uh, employee time working on it, it can be code, it can be um, in terms of event hosting and uh, supporting events like this. But it's a long-term business investment. So I guess that's a summary of free and open source technology. It's a lot more than free, it's a lot more than open source and we're very privileged today uh, to hear some of the uh, fantastic speakers from um, around Belfast and much further abroad uh, to give us some examples of that. So I guess let's sit back, relax, and hear some of the ways that free software is every day changing the world around us. Thank you very much.